This episode is sponsored by the TTM Academy at Penn Medicine, an educational initiative to improve care for patients following cardiac arrest and other neurocritical care illnesses using targeted temperature management. Find out more at PennTTM.com. Hey, podcast listeners, Fawaz al Mufti here from Westchester Medical Center, New York Medical College, and this is the Neurocritical Care Podcast. Intracerebral hemorrhage has greater morbidity and mortality than ischemic stroke. However, no evidence-based primary treatment exists. The evolution of ICH management has yet to lead to concrete interventions significantly impacting functional outcomes. Trials of craniotomy have not improved functional outcomes or mortality, and procedures aimed at reducing hematoma expansion, such as for antifibrinolytics and early blood pressure reduction, have only had limited or no benefit on the ultimate functional outcomes in this disease. There has long been an interest in surgical evacuation of ICH with the aim of mitigating secondary effects of large volume bleeds on the brain. However, recent well-conducted trials of craniotomy for supratentorial ICH failed to realize significant benefits in functional outcome. Minimally invasive interventions for ICH evacuation have held more promise, presumably by sparing the brain, added damage of surgical manipulation. I'm pleased to be joined today by Dr. Daniel Hanley, who is Professor of Neurology and Director of Brain Injury Outcomes Division at Johns Hopkins University, and Dr. Osama Awad, Professor of Neurosurgery and Neurology and Director of Neurovascular Surgery at the University of Chicago, on behalf of the MISTI-3 investigators. We'll be discussing the results and the findings of their trial entitled Efficacy and Safety of Minimally Invasive Surgery with Thrombolysis in Intracerebral Hemorrhage Evacuation, MISTI-3, a randomized controlled open-label blinded endpoint phase 3 trial that was published in The Lancet last February 2019. Dr. Hanley and Dr. Rawad, welcome and thank you very much for joining us on the Neurocritical Care Society podcast. You're welcome. Thank you. Dr. Hanley and Dr. Rawad, I'd like to start by asking you to tell us something about yourself and your research interests. Sure. Uh, I'm an internist and a neurologist and a stroke specialist who started out in the brain intensive care unit and through the Brain Intensive Care Unit, I started reading uh, Assam Awad's papers about brain intensive care for subarachnoid hemorrhage, and we were fortunate enough to meet early on in our careers, and we've collaborated since as stroke physicians, trialist scientists, and without speaking for Assam, as systems physiologists and molecular-interested clinicians. I'm Isam Awad. I am a vascular neurosurgeon, and I have studied basically blood vessels of the brain and brain hemorrhage for the last 30 years. Most of my laboratory work deals with mechanisms of hemorrhage in the brain and genes predisposing to weakening blood vessels and the effect of blood on the brain. But I had a second training throughout my career, which is in a clinical trial science, working with Dr. Hanley for the last 20 plus years. And uh, uh, we have uh, worked on bringing surgical uh, approaches and neurocritical care approaches to clinical trials. Oh, that's excellent. All right. So let's, let's dive right into the MISTI-3 trial. Could you tell us something about the background research and prior work that was done on minimally invasive surgical procedures for intracerebral hemorrhage, and what did MISTI-3 seek to achieve? Sure. MISTI-2 and and MISTI-3 have clearly uh, changed the stroke community's dynamic around the idea of ICH and, and primary treatment, and I think the stroke community is now optimistic about achieving a primary intervention that treats the the blood clot in ICH. Assam and I, as physicians and as bench scientists, saw that the Chinese and Japanese and Koreans and uh, other people in Asia uh, were treating ICH with minimally invasive surgery. And our third colleague, Mario Zuccarello, was at the forefront of developing both a pathophysiologic and an interventional model here in the States, and we saw that people were not bringing NIH-level individual investigator-sponsored and advocated clinical trial science rigor to what was a very promising therapy in Asia, but not fully validated. And 
it was that that we took up as an original goal when we started both the CLEAR and, and MISTI programs around clot reduction. For MISTI 3, because of the success of the prior programs, and specifically because in MISTI 2, we, we found a, an outright primary endpoint positive effect of an estimate of 10% uh, benefit at the MRS long-term outcome level for the MISTI procedure as a primary clot removal procedure. Uh, we organized MISTI 3 around three real goals. The first was to re establish what was established in MISTI 2 that this procedure could be done safely on the acute ICH patient, and second, to establish that the procedure had a benefit uh, in functional outcome, which we estimated around 10 to 12 percent, and that it had a benefit in mortality. And the third goal was to study the delivery of the surgical procedure or surgical task and to see whether the quality of performing the surgical task had any influence on the outcome. And I think we created new knowledge in all three domains, and in two out of the three domains, we reached, uh, I think, a definitive or even landmark accomplishments. Assam? Excellent. Yeah, Yeah, I think I I would add uh, a very unique feature of the MISTI trials and before them the CLEAR trials uh, of the collaborative nature between neurocritical care physicians, surgeons in the management of the patients, patient selection, and uh, the execution of the trial uh, task. So uh, it was really a very uh, collaborative effort and therefore any generalizability of this experience will need to involve this type of team collaboration between critical care doctors and surgeons uh, who both are are interested and willing to to maintain a level of depth and expertise in this disease. Excellent. This is a great segue into our next question about trial design and methodology. What were your primary and secondary outcomes, and what was the effect size that you were looking for? Sure. The primary outcome was, do we improve the MRS score, the modified Rankin score, at the cut point of the proportion of patients who can achieve the 0 to 3 score versus the proportion who can achieve the 4 to 6 score? And the reason we chose that cut point is that that represents, the Rankin 3 state represents individuals who are going to be independent at home, which is what, when we as physicians meet with the families of ICH patients, is the second question they ask. The first question they ask is, my loved one going to live or die? And then they ask, are they going to be able to return to a large part of their prior life? So in peer review, our peers, peer neurosurgeons and neurologists, asked us to ask the second question first, so we did. Functional outcome is first, and the the next question was mortality. And the third question, which we asked a couple of different ways analytically, was does good surgery matter? Well, we put the whole trial design and methodology on clinicaltrials.gov, and there are other secondary and tertiary uh, endpoints but they're organized in the way that I just gave you. The details are all there. The most important thing that I want to say goes back to Assam's initial comment, and I'm sure he's going to comment on this next statement as well. We did two things about the intervention in order to rigorously test for effect size. By creating this environment where intensivists and surgeons would collaborate together, we attempted to have a very standard approach, and I think we succeeded in this, to the general medical care that has to do with stabilization, and you you talked about that in your introduction, and and then the general ongoing ICU care before and after the surgery, Uh, so that that was all the standard elements everybody received, and you can see that in the in the MISTI manuscript, in the, the table that describes the care that people received. The second thing we did was we broke the surgery 
and this came from MISTI too, uh, we broke the surgery into discrete tasks with measurable endpoints that allowed to precisely quantify the surgical uh, performance in terms that can easily be, be measured for the discrete surgical performance and we correlated that discrete surgical performance with the, the goal of surgery, which is long-term clinical goals. And I would say that the three surgical components are defining the localization of the ICH, planning image guidance, and then two discrete surgical tasks, how you perform the cannulation of the hematoma and how you irrigated the, the hematoma. And I think that's the, the, the overall setup of, of how we organize the trial. And I'm, I'm sure Assam uh, will have things to say about that. So a, a couple of the, of the things uh, had to be the uh, training and qualification of the surgeons, ensuring that uh, they are uh, fully credentialed and experienced in performing stereotactic procedures and catheter placement uh, in the brain, and then a process of uh, mentoring and monitoring performance of the surgeons during the course of the trial uh, with the mentoring progressing according to their experience. So uh, the surgeon always had the benefit of oversight and consultation with a surgical center that is experienced with the procedure. So it's like they have a senior partner who knows how to do the procedure. And uh, we monitored very closely the performance of the surgical task, knowing that this is an extremely important aspect uh, of the success uh, of the trial. Despite the oversight, each surgeon executed the task in the way that they're always executed with the sur surgeon's best judgment at the operating site. Got it. Excellent. Can we elaborate on the findings of the trial now? Sure. Uh, the population that we studied was a population with what we clinically call large intracerebral hemorrhage. They were hemorrhages that on the initial measurements at the site using the ABC divide by two method measured 30 milliliters of blood or greater. And the average size of the hematomas was between 45 and, and 50 cc's in both groups. And demographically, there was nice balance in the presenting baseline variables that epidemiologically can alter outcome or alter the severity of a group in almost all but not all of the variables. Uh, so age, DCS, percent, and size of IVH extension were all exceedingly well matched because we used an adaptive trial design that, that matched those variables. The uh, low bar versus deep location, deep having a worse prognosis than low bar, wasn't perfectly matched, but we the mismatch was 7% more deep in the surgical group, giving the surgeons a harder set prognostically of patients to work on, slightly harder than medical therapy. So it's what you would ask for if, if you were going to have a true test of surgery. The primary outcome adjusting for those variables found a, a 4% benefit of improving the modified proportion of the modified rank in zero to three. The main two areas of consideration about what we talked about ICU care and surgical performance were very informative. ICU care was the same in both the medical group and the surgical group, but we noted that caring for ICP was not as difficult in the surgical group as it was in the medical group. The surgical performance was not as good as we had hoped for, but it was much better than it was in, in, in MISTI-2. 58% uh, of the surgeons reached the pre-stated, a priori, planned, you notice I'm emphasizing all three of those, uh, goal of reducing the hematoma to 15 milliliters. We set that goal because that's what we found was associated with improved modified rank in 0 to 3 in MISTI-2. And we also used that goal because intuitively 
If you start with a, a 30 milliliter hematoma as the smallest one you're going to start with, in order to make a substantial improvement, you have to reduce the size of the hematoma to a size that is smaller than anything we would currently operate on. So hence the 15 milliliter goal. And the group that did reach that goal, which was 58 or 59 percent of all the surgically operated upon patients, did achieve the postulated 10 percent improvement in the modified rank of zero to three proportion. For the second finding, mortality, the intervention achieved within one week and sustained for the 365-day period a 6 to 8 percent mortality difference that reached statistical significance with the selected test, the Cox proportional hazard that adjusts for variation in, in severity. The third goal, does surgery matter or not, we tested two different ways. First, uh, we tested it on uh, is there a relationship between the amount of clot removed and outcome, and we found an exceedingly strong relationship between uh, the amount of clot removed and uh, good outcome. And finally, we tested it on a per-protocol basis, which is did the group of patients who met the a surgical goal of 15 milliliters, and this group is 60% of the patients, did they do better than the patients who did not? And the answer there was a statistically significant finding with an odds ratio of two and an absolute effect size of 10.5%. On the safety issues, we confirmed the safety profile of MISTI-2, and we had an additional finding uh, with an abundance of caution, we had in the safety program uh, an analysis that said, were there deaths in the first seven days that were attributable to surgery? And we did that because everybody attributes poor outcome to surgeons. But in point of fact, the deaths in the first seven days were attributable to randomization to medical care, to not having a surgeon on your team. And those are the main findings. Very interesting. I was wondering if you can clarify how different sites managed withdrawal of care on patients randomized into either arm. Sure. We had a program to both have a uniform ICU approach to withdrawal of care, to one, do as the guidelines do and avoid at the team level any prognostication and any suggestion that withdrawal of care is appropriate at the beginning of the trial. And the families, when they were consented, were asked if you want to withdraw care. And if they did, they were allowed to do that. So none of the families wanted to withdraw care. We allowed for any stage, but we hoped that the majority of them would be after the first week, which is more than the guideline set aside time for having a withdrawal of care conversation. Anybody who wanted to have that conversation could. And those conversations occurred equally in both the medical and surgical group across the entire 365-day time period. When you inspect the data, some of the surgical patients had a tendency to have withdrawal of care a little later than the medical patients, but it did not reach statistical significance. Terrific. Thank you very much. So it's my understanding that the pre-specified surgical goal of less than 15 ml residual clot volume was achieved in only 58% in the surgical arm. Do you yes. believe that this was related to the morphology and the depth of the hematoma? Were there any protocol deviations that contributed to this? What were the factors that predicted failure to reach this surgical goal? Since Assam led the surgical center, he mentioned earlier that this was a, a unique part of our trial, and they were directed to manage these points. I think you should answer that. Yeah, let me uh, let me comment on that. In fact, the answers to those questions were the subject of a follow-up paper that was published in Neurosurgery in July 2019. Uh, it was the cover issue of that journal, and it was published online, actually, in March 2019 just a, a couple of months after the Lancet paper. But basically, the the more important aspect is that we were monitoring for the mean performance of the surgeons throughout the trial 
And in fact, we, we were very pleased that the trial performance uh, in terms of extent of hematoma removal and cases meeting, meeting the endpoint was actually better than it had been in MISTI-2. And the average removal of hematoma was close to 15 ml. But as you point out, uh, in about 58% of the cases, uh, the numbers were short of the 15 ml uh, goal. And when we analyzed uh, those thresholds, two points became important. The 15 ml threshold individually was required to achieve the benefit in terms of MRS 0 to 3. So an average performance to that goal did not guarantee the trial reaching that endpoint. So if the cases had reached the uh, less than 15 ml goal, then the MRS benefit was in fact uh, achieved. And in those cases where that goal was reached, we did very uh, extensive controlled analyses that showed that those patients benefited uh, from the operation in terms of MRS 0 to 3. Furthermore, the mortality benefit was actually achieved with removing about half the clot so that you didn't even have to reach the 15 ml in order to achieve the mortality benefit. So those results are detailed in the neurosurgery paper, and I think they give us pause in terms of similar such trials where the goal uh, as an average was not sufficient, but you had to achieve it in individual cases in order to derive the benefit. Uh, This was not known going into the into the trial so uh, it might have been uh, argued whether uh, the individuals should have pushed further to achieve the 15 ml goal and there were approximately 30 percent of the cases including many that i performed myself where we stopped at perhaps 17 or 18 ml uh, weighing risk benefit of giving an additional dose and not knowing that 15 ml was needed for the benefit. So so the, the surgeons had to weigh what they knew during the trial, which they did not know the results of the trial, in terms of risk-benefit of additional dosing. What we know now is that the risk of additional dose did not uh, increase while the benefit was realized. So we can now, in light of the trial, uh, raise the bar in terms of achieving the end point of removing more uh, is important, which was not known uh, to the same extent during the trial. Uh, Protocol violations did occur, and we analyzed uh, those in detail, as well as some inherent limitations with some hematoma shapes, uh, such as those with satellite bleeds, where you could remove the major hematoma completely, and you might be left with satellite bleeds that are not amenable to any evacuation procedure, uh, since you cannot reach out beyond the main hematoma cavity. Beyond those particular exceptions and the protocol deviations that could be improved with additional education, training, and experience. The mere knowledge of the endpoint and what it takes to achieve benefit, uh, I think, can alter practice and can alter the stance uh, in performing this and other such procedures. So I hope this was helpful in clarifying cause and effect here, knowing what we knew during the trial. Absolutely. No, this is terrific. A couple things that Assam said, but the group that achieved the benefit was 58%, and that's also the group that where the surgical task was performed. 42% did not. Characteristics of that group were irregular shape, targeting surgical targeting failure, and not persisting in dosing long enough. Those, those are the, the three clinical characteristics. If you reached that goal, there actually was an absolute reduction in mortality of 13% that went along with the 10 or 11% benefit. And the threshold for altering mortality 
was just to reduce the hematoma size to 30 milliliters, but the threshold for altering benefit was the threshold of 15 milliliters. MRS benefit, 0 to 3 benefit. Right, 0 to 3 benefit. And and that's all very nicely outlined in, in Assam's beautiful paper. The most impressive clinical benefit, although still non-significant, was observed for those patients whose treatment was initiated within 36 hours of randomization. What could you tell us about the timing of hematoma evacuation? And is it possible that earlier surgery might curtail hematoma expansion and allow greater potential for neurologic recovery? Yeah, let me comment a little bit on that and then Dan will add because we have done a lot of analyses on this. I think the premise that hematoma removal will curtail hematoma expansion uh, is basically a, a premise that, that has never been tested because in the MISTI procedure, as well as in all other uh, clinical trials of surgery versus medical management, you have to assume stability of the hematoma. If the hematoma is expanding, you're never going to randomize the patient so that these are cases where the hematoma has already stabilized. If you are going to operate in the setting of an expanding hematoma, that is going to be a, a totally non-generalizable result because there is going to be potentially more bleeding in the brain and it will uh, have to be tested in phase two before being taken to phase three. So uh, we are not advocating in any shape or form operating in the middle of an expanding hematoma. Now, having said that the hematoma is stable, an argument could be made that faster removal could result in better outcome. We tested that hypothesis in both the cases that underwent MISTI as well as in the cases uh, who underwent a stitch 1 and stitch 2 open surgery where we had data on the delay between onset of symptoms and surgery. And across all these three trials, a delay of up to three days beyond 48 hours did not result in any impact on worsening outcome. Only delays beyond five days in MISTI uh, resulted in worse outcome. And this could have been both a cause and an effect because if you wait five days and the cloth wasn't removed, maybe even the task wasn't done properly at all. But delays for up to three days had absolutely no signal of worsened outcome as compared to the cases where the surgical task was accomplished in the first day which we had many cases where the surgical task was accomplished in the first day and they did not uh, have a better outcome. I think that's a good answer. Uh, I'd add only two minor points. Not only can we not comment on the unstable patient because we didn't have any. We had the most stringent definition of stability. You had to show two CT scans in which the hematoma was not enlarging in order to assess surgery. And that was specifically because we didn't want instability to influence the outcome. The second point is that in that population, our estimate of subsequent instability, as characterized by major rebleeding, is between 1% and 2%, and it wasn't different in the surgical arm and the medical arm. So we think, if you take the data as a whole, that what it says is that surgery can work on the stable patient as long as potentially out to three plus days. That's good for patients because we know that they're not all getting referred in on the first day. The surgeons go through a lot of anxiety about uh, once the patient's ready for surgery, do I do it in the middle of the night or do I wait till first thing in the morning when I can have my full and experienced team? And our data makes the argument that surgeons and ICU doctors can have the comfort of waiting 12 hours until they have their full team to do the procedure in the right way. And to remove the clot rather than doing haphazardly in the middle of the night, perhaps by a junior trainee, and, and have more blood left behind. Right. That we would call sham surgery, and that's not good. If you don't do surgery with the goals that Assam defined, you're not doing it the right way, and you probably do want your team to be fresh to do that. Excellent. 
Why did you choose a modified ranking score of 0 to 3 on the functional outcome as opposed to 0 to 2, which many of the stroke trials use? There are tertiary analyses about quality of life. Those tertiary analyses bolster the original hypothesis that the Rankin 0 to 3 cut point, including the Rankin 3s in a good outcome, is the correct beneficial outcome. And the patient preference or patient reported outcomes, particularly the Euroqual and the stroke impact scale, show that the patient's preference for their value of life at 365 days is a, a Euroqual of between 68 and 75, which is the same as the age-matched Euroqual for normal patients at those ages in America who haven't had an ICH. So we think the zero to three cut point has been affirmed by the tertiary analyses also, and there'll be a present, we hope, we don't know for sure, but we hope there'll be a presentation about that at the ISC this year. Excellent. So this brings me to my last question. Industry-funded trials such as the INVEST and MIND studies evaluating endoscopic ICH evacuation and the ENRICH trial evaluating endoport-mediated evacuation through a small craniotomy are already underway. How do you feel these trials will complement the MISTI findings? Yeah, let me start, uh, start at this because as a surgeon, we always struggle with the idea of is the next technique better than the prior technique or is a different technique could accomplish something different. So I think we have a great opportunity with these emerging trials for doing a very rigorous comparative effectiveness type analyses. My only, my only caution is that we need to stay very rigorous in terms of sticking to uh, comparable indications and if the indications are different, to have these very clearly articulated. Also, third-party adjudication of outcome and enrollment of all eligible cases, because there has been a tendency in some of the smaller trials to have a lot of cherry-picking of cases and uh, reporting of outcomes that wouldn't really withstand the same type of rigor that was deployed in MISTI. So I think, you know, the, the, it is important to stay rigorous as we engage in, in these comparisons comparative effectiveness type studies. But having said this, I would foresee in the future, and Dan also the same, uh, that there may be more than one tool to accomplish uh, reduction. And maybe the tool is not as important, provided that it meets the same criteria of safety and effectiveness, but that those criteria are met, not just merely in non-inferiority, underpowered uh, type of conclusions, but in properly powered and rigorous comparison. I think that's a good overview. Two minor points. We believe that eventually there will be a comparative effectiveness type of approach to surgical treatment. And if it's designed with the rigor that Assam outlined, then we'll be able to compare the performance of the surgical task with the different kinds of, of techniques. And that will give us uh, important information, like the information we've created in MISTI, about how to perform the technique and, and the details of, of how to perform the technique. We'd like to see tested the idea that something that does very little tissue disruption, gentle irrigation of the clot done in MISTI, be compared to the mechanically more vigorous interventions uh, that are being done in MIND, in INVEST, and in RICH. And we'd like to see investigations of the different time frames that can be achieved on equally stable or equally unstable patients. Those are going to be characteristics that have to be accounted for. In order for us to get away from what happened in Asia, where people moved from one technique to another, but never proved the primary hypothesis that surgery is better than just providing medical care in the ICU. And we do have to concentrate on that goal. I would also add maybe one additional point that the Surgical learning curve and the generalizability might be very, very different with, with different techniques, and, and that needs to be tested separately. All of the techniques have their champions uh, who help develop them, and obviously they perform differently in the hands of 
those champions than when deployed in the community. Hassan's being modest. The only data to date that, that has information on what's the learning curve for a technique is the, the MISTI data that he's published in the Neurosurgery Journal. And I think that's the starting point for us understanding the issue that you questioned us deeply about, and that is how do you make the procedure better and, and what are the characteristics of a procedure that wasn't as effective? Excellent. So MISTI helped generate an affluence of data that provided invaluable insight into this devastating disease. Dr. Hanley and Dr. Awad, in conclusion, I'd like to congratulate you, your co-investigators, the patients and their families for their incredible effort in providing us with this critical insight towards developing an effective treatment strategy for ICH. You're very welcome. Thank you. The NCS podcast series is produced by the Neurocritical Care Society whose mission is to promote quality patient care, professional collaboration, research, training, and advocacy in neurocritical care. Our production staff includes Bawaz Mufti, Lumani Balu, Mike Brogan, Josh Levine, Benjamin Miller, Storain Shepard, Jim Siegler, Sarah Sternezer, and Chris Zamet. Our senior producer is Bonnie Rousseau. Our administrative staff includes Bonnie Rousseau, Angel Gindel, Sarah Mimmin, and Becca Stickman. Music is created by Mohan Katapali from the Division of Neurocritical Care at the University of Miami. The NCS podcast series is available on NCS On Demand and wherever you may listen to your podcast. For more information, please follow us on Twitter at Neurocritical or on Facebook. I'm Fawad al thanks for listening.